everyone. Thanks for taking a few minutes to tune in, listen to another lecture. Uh, I want to take some time today and talk to you about terminal bradycardia, um, why it's important, and what we can do to prevent further progression of it into cardiac arrest and do what's best for our patients. So terminal bradycardia isn't really a official medical term. Um, it's not something you're going to see in a lot of medical literature. Um, you can think of it more as like a pericardial bradycardia or a pericardial arrhythmia in our sick crashing patients. Um, when we see it, we see it in patients that, you know, are from whatever underlying pathophysiology, really, really sick when we get to them, they're getting worse and worse, they're circling the drain, and then you see them start to breathe down. Um, and usually we see a really severe sinus bradycardia, so like 30s, 40s, but the key here is that's a sinus bradycardia. It's not some other sort of block or dysrhythmia causing a bradycardia. So it's not a, you know, um, internal native pacemaker cardiac electrical system problem. It's a problem with the other passive pathophysiology in the body. We've all had these patients before. Um, we will all continue to have these patients where we get there or um, there's some sort of intervention done and the patient looks bad and they start to look worse. And then you hear the monitor beep slow down. You look over the monitor and they're starting to break down and they're just kind of circling the drain. And you're trying a bunch of things and nothing really helps. And then everyone's scrambling and then they go into a PEA arrest. Um, really, it's due to the end stage of underlying critical illness. So hop killers is a good mnemonic. I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, have learned hop killers the mnemonic when we were learning um, resuscitation and intubation of patients. It was created for patients being intubated and um, the critical patients, especially that are being intubated um, and to highlight the importance of um, addressing and kind of fixing um, underlying problems resuscitating our patients before we intubate them. Um, H stands for uh, hypotension, O, hypoxia, and PEPH, so acidosis. Those are really big, pretty big things that if you don't um, improve, stabilize, resuscitate before you intubate a patient, you're doing them a disservice and putting them at high risk for um, decompensation and cardiac arrest. Um, but hopkillers can kind of be applied to this um, terminal bradycardia in a sense. So really our hypoxic patients, mostly hypoxic patients, we mostly see terminal bradycardia, pericardial bradycardia in our end stage uh, respiratory hypoxic patients, but we can see it in our patients who are just profoundly hypotensive or acidotic from whatever underlying pathway. This is really just to show you that a lot of different um, disease processes can lead to this terminal bradycardia endpoint. Classically, we'll see it in our COPD or in flash pulmonary edema patients. Um, or maybe even our aspiration or septic patients, um, because those are kind of like our bread and butter respiratory patients, but you can really see it in any sort of disease process. Your massive PE is not very common for us to see it, but it can happen. Our really severe acidosis, maybe our DKAs, our tox patients, uh, our patients in shock for whatever reason. Lots of different things come to the single final pathway. So why do we care about this? Well. When patients start to enter this um, terminal bradycardia rhythm or this pericardial arrhythmia rhythm, it means that we're now in our final minute to minutes to help try to stabilize this patient and turn them around. So that means that the path that we go down really matters. And that if we take the wrong path or do the wrong thing for the patient, there often isn't time to come back and pivot to another treatment modality. And that patient will now be in cardiac arrest before we can do that. Um, and I really say that, and I want to tie this back to what I said on the first slide, is that it's a sinus bradycardia we see in these terminal bradycardia patients. It's not an electrical system problem, is that pacing these patients is not the right thing to do. And it wastes precious time getting the pads on, pacing them, trying to figure out if there's a mechanical capture, electrical capture, what have you. Um, that takes more than a few seconds to do, and it's often always the wrong thing to do for the patient. And... Um, doesn't really address the underlying cause. I know it's difficult to break that mindset because we've all been brought up in ACLS and years and years and years of it being beaten into our minds that bradycardia, unstable, equals pacing. Uh, but this is where being a clinician and um, using the entire clinical information in front of you really kind of allows you to break off from those algorithms a bit. Um, and this is an exact situation where we want you to do that and realize that sinus bradycardia in a crashing primarily respiratory patient um, does not mean that pacing is the next step. So if we can't pace them, 
if we shouldn't pace them, then what should we do? Because we're already giving them oxygen. We're already trying to support them. Well, the annoying answer really is to fix the underlying cause. So if they're hypoxic, that means flooding them with oxygen, not just an army breather, not just the nasal cannula, but using two um, sources of oxygen at flush rate, crank that up, make it loud in the room, carry two bottles of oxygen up. I know it's annoying to carry two oxygen bags or two oxygen cylinders up with you and have to carry two down with the patient on it. It's a mess. It can be annoying. It's heavy. There's going to be a lot of people involved, but it's the right thing to do for the patient. If they're hypotensive, you should be aggressive with your IV fluids and be early with your pressors. And then for our patients who you think have some sort of acidotic process going on, maybe you know they're diabetic and their sugar is high, or they look really septic, um, or they're breathing really fast when you got there. If you're at a point where you have to take over respirations for them, I want you to think about trying to match that respiratory rate as best you can. Um, when patients become acidotic, um, we classically see in our diabetic patients are those are Kussmaul respirations. The way the body compensates is by blowing off CO2. So we release a lot of acid in our breath when we blow it off. So you breathe faster to release more acid. So if you have a patient you think is acidotic and they're breathing 30, 40 times a minute on their own, and then they go down and you have to start begging for them, I want you to try to match that as best you can. Now, of course, it's not as simple as just throwing them on and not a breather and nasal cannula and they're going to go back to a normal rhythm and their blood pressure is going to go up and they're going to look so much better. There's going to be other things going on that you have to do. Um, this is really where our supportive medications come into play. Um, the most important supportive medication that you can give these pericode terminal bradycardia patients is epi. And, you know, that comes in two flavors, push just epi versus epi drip, depending on, you know, what your protocols say and what you have available to you. Um, but push just epi is a great first choice drug. Um, it comes pre-made or you can make it yourself. It's super easy to make, um, but if you have the pre-made uh, syringe of push epi, that's even better. Um, epi drips are great for um, if your protocol allows it and your patient's responsive to push epi. The problem that we see with push epi a lot is that it requires you to constantly be on top of it and giving it every couple of minutes. So there are oftentimes lags in the pre hospital world, whether you're moving the patient down off the stairs or extricating them or whatever, what have you, there's something else going on that if there's a missed dose or two or prolonged from first dose or second dose to epi that um, it might've worn off and we're kind of back in our starting spot. So epi drip um, is really great to kind of bridge that gap between them um, and provide a continuous infusion if you know that the epi works. Uh, if you don't have access to an epi drip, a uh, nor epi drip or a levo drip is also a great option. Um, atropine, really not that important in these patients. I won't fault you. It's not a bad idea to try to give a dose of atropine. It's just the way atropine works is it blocks the vagus nerve and kind of increases heart rate that way. It's kind of more of a cardiac electrical pacemaker type of drug than an actual um, presser medication. So similar to pacing these patients, atropine probably really won't do anything. Now atropine is a lot faster and easier to give a dose of atropine from the amp than it is to hook the pacer pads and spend a minute or two setting your milliamps and trying to figure out if you have electrical capture versus mechanical capture. So um, atropine, you know, if you're trying push this epi, if you're getting your drip set up and you want to give push this, or give a push of atropine, that's fine. But really, really tiny here is pacing. And I don't want you to pace these patients. Um, and now, of course, if it is the last thing you're trying and they've gotten a whole stick of push recepi and fluids and they're on CPAP with nasal cannula underneath of it and they've gotten atropine, they're still not budging, then sure, yes, pacing might be the appropriate next step. But it shouldn't be the first thing you do in these patients. Now, um, if you're at that point where you're going to start pacing these patients, but you should not really ever be patient with pacing these patients. It's important to make sure you have mechanical capture. Really any patient that you're pacing, make sure you have mechanical capture because it happens quite frequently everywhere that you get electrical capture and there's a few minutes before anybody remembers to check mechanical capture. Quick pharmacology detour. I think it's really important to understand what the medications we use give and why they work. Um, I don't like pharmacology that much myself either. Looking at these slides make me nauseous, but it's important to make us good providers. So uh, epi down here, Ooh. epi down here, um, kind of works on two different receptors, the alpha receptor and the beta receptor. Think of alpha as more of your peripheral blood vessels um, and squeezing those down, increase your blood pressure. Think of beta primarily being in your heart. So um, beta receptors cause harder squeeze, so increased blood pressure and cardiac output and um, increased heart rate or chronotropy, so it's going to increase that heart rate. So, you know, in our hypotensive, hypoxic, crashing terminal bradycardia patients, epi is a great first-line drug because you're going to get increased blood pressure, you're going to get increased 
um, squeeze the heart, get your cardiac output, and your heart rate's going to go up theoretically. Um, norepi is a great second line drug in these um, patients. It's kind of very similar, but in a sense, a little opposite of epi. So it has more alpha, so it has more peripheral vasoconstriction going on. So your blood pressure is going to go up. Um, it has a little bit of beta, so it should increase your heart rate a bit. Um, it should increase that squeeze force a little bit. Um, but push this epi should be your first line in these patients. Making push dose epi is super, super easy. If you work at an agency that has pre-filled push dose epi syringes, you're lucky. Um, but it doesn't mean that if you don't have it, you shouldn't do it because that's a hassle to make. All you have to do is take a flush. You waste a CC out of that flush. Now you have a nine, you have a flush with nine CCs in it. You take your cardiac epi. You take a CC out of that cardiac epi into your flush with nine mLs. So now you have 10 mLs, nine of which are saline or your flush and one mLs of which is um, your co epi. You mix it up and now you have push epi, which is uh, 10 mics per mL. Super, 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 super easy. Takes 30 seconds, literally. Atropine is our anti-muscarinic drug. That's the mechanism it works on. To keep it simple, it blocks the innervation or the signal from the vagus nerve to the SA and AV nodes in the heart, um, which stops the, no the nerve from slowing down the heart. If you're on a patient that has um, really bad COPD, flash pulmonary edema, and they're hypoxic, I don't think atropine is really going to do anything if they're reaching their terminal bradycardia phase, just based on the mechanism it uses. Um, I also want to take a moment to talk about oxygenation in our patients because, um, one, it's really applicable to these patients, especially our hypoxic patients, but two, it's good to know just in baseline when you're treating patients. So FiO2 percentages um, at room air, FiO2 is around 21%. When you're using nasal cannula, a good cheat code you can use for it is to add about 4% to the FiO2 um, for every liter of nasal cannula you use. So one liter of nasal cannula will get you around 24, 25% FiO2. So six um, liters nasal cannula will get you around 44, 45% FiO2, um, depending on the source you look at. Non-ray breather at 15 liters per minute gets you around 60 to 90% FiO2, um, probably more 60% FiO2. To really get that 90% FiO2, you have to have a perfect seal of the mask on your face and have no leaks whatsoever. And the reservoir has to be perfectly full and there has to be no interruptions in the flow, of, you know, no switching tanks here or there. So it's probably more around 60%. I mean, how many times do you get a non out of the bag and it's cold outside or, you know, it's been squished in the bag and it's kind of like not really sealing on their face too well, or they're really not super responsive. So they're kind of like a little um, gorked breathing, the non breather when you're trying to pre-oxygenate them. It's probably more uh, 60%. Um, when you think about 45% of your nasal cannula, you're really probably not getting 45%. There's this um, phenomenon of oxygen washout. So if you do six liters of nasal cannula through the nose, but your patient's breathing 20 times a minute um, very rapidly, mo mostly through the mouth, um, they're getting a bunch of 21% FiO2 from the room through their mouth. Um, and only a little bit of 45% through their nose. So a lot of that 45% gets washed out. Um, so you kind of down your FiO2 with those two. And something that's really important to know and to be familiar with your own CPAP, if you carry CPAP your agency, um, is that a lot of CPAPs at 15 liters per minute, which is what they're designed to work off of, only provide about 30% FiO2, which kind of makes sense because CPAP is, you know, primarily supposed to be um, a pressure support device, let take open those alveoli. Um, not really marketed as a um, high FiO2 oxygen delivery device. So this is just a plug to get familiar with the CPAP device you have and know what percentage FiO2 it provides. Because if your patient needs CPAP and FiO2 and you put them on just CPAP at 30%, you're really doing them a disservice. You're pretty much just putting them on room air, like a giant fan blowing uh, room air in their face. Now, there are CPAPs that have different FiO2, like, valve settings on the actual tubing that plugs into the oxygen cylinder. Um, I think it was like Pulmodyne has one that goes to 30, 60, and 90. Um, but not all CPAPs will have that. So just really get familiar with the CPAP you have and what options you have. A great option if you don't have that device that changes the percent FiO2 right in line with the CPAP 
um, would be combining CPAP and another oxygen delivery device. So either putting a nasal cannula and flush rate it, so all the way up, make it loud. Um, or some of these CPAP devices have a accessory port on the side of the mask that you can just plug oxygen tubing straight into, and then you can just flood that with oxygen. And yes, like we said before, this means bringing two bottles of oxygen up those three flights of stairs to your patient and carrying two bottles of oxygen down when they're on the stair chair or reeves or whatever you're doing. And it's really annoying and it sucks, but it's just the right thing to do for the patient. Um, in the new New Jersey um, protocols, we actually uh, added a section for crashing medical patients in extremis. Really, I want you to know that patients that we show up to that really need us have found a position of comfort. So, you know, there's often this patients that we'll go to that it doesn't matter if we got there 30 minutes before or two hours after, they probably would have been fine. But the patients that we got to and our actions in the next two, three minutes actually matter. And we'll make an outcome on this patient, determine whether they can survive and go to the hospital, go into a cardiac arrest. Um, these are the patients we're talking about. And these are the patients that we want you to sit on scene and treat and resuscitate before moving. Um, these patients have found some corner of the room, some position in their body that have optimized themselves, made them get as much oxygen as possible. Um, and by moving them out of that position of comfort, out of that room, putting them on the stair chair, laying them flat, whatever you have you without resuscitating them can really be the easy ticking point into them going into or crashing and going into cardiac arrest. So, you know, aside from really bad safety concerns or biohazard or whatever, um, I want you to sit in the room and take care of these patients on scene and optimize them before moving them. Pennsylvania has had this um, protocol for a little while now. Um, kind of, a lot of other states are starting to adopt it too. So I spent all this time saying that bradycardia should not be paced. And it's really not what I'm trying to get out here. I'm trying to get at this idea that terminal bradycardia, that sinus bradycardia in your crashing medical patients, pacing should not be the pathway that you initially go down. Um, pacing and atropine and other um, electrical system support is great for brady dysrhythmias from an electrical conduction issue, right? Your old grandma, grandpa, or in heart block. But the reality is, is these patients just don't present like our terminal bradycardia patients, right? Our terminal bradycardia patients are that really sick, crashy patient in front of you. You know, they look terrible. They're hypoxic. They're sweating. They're starting to go unresponsive. Those are the patients. And, and they go into a sinus brady. That's the terminal bradycardia patient. This isn't your old patient who has a third degree heart block that you hook up in the monitor and be like, oh, whoa. You know, it's like, oh, I was a little dizzy and I passed out. And maybe they pass out a few times in front of you and it's freaky and it's weird. But, you know, they wake back up and they're not toxic. They're not toxic appearing. Um, so these are the patients that I want you to think about pacing on, not your terminal bradycardic crashing patients. All right, so some big takeaways from this. In your crashing terminal bradycardia patient, I want you to be aggressive in treating the underlying cause. I want you to provide as much oxygen as you can, bring two bottles up, use multiple modes of oxygen delivery devices. Okay, be familiar with what your CPAP, if you have it at your agency, you can do what its limitations are. Be early in your use of vasopressors, especially push dose epi, and be aggressive. Um, and really don't get sucked into wasting a little bit of time you have with these patients, going down the wrong pathway and trying to pace them. All right, as always, if you have any questions, find me, shoot me an email. Always happy to chat. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.